Hi, we are live Thursday morning of Mental Health Awareness Week. We've had an amazing run of guests, and this one's a total badass superhero. Um, Zoe Cruz, he's got a Harley Street practice, has been a yeah top hypnotherapist um, for 20 years now, former right. party girl, so oh, yes. lived it, breathed it. Um, dealt with it, and it <laughs> still <round>. dealing um, <laughs> yes. with it. Um, but we, so basically, we covered so many different things that we, rather than sort of try and do loads of loads of bits, we're kind of today sort of focusing on on trauma um, and how you don't really realise sort of what when you're little or even you know twenties, thirties, whatever, how little things. We're just talking actually about my dog being nicked, and I still don't know where it is, and it's just sort of how it. 10 years on it's still there and you don't deal with these things so um we're gonna yeah just sort of talk about trauma and the signs and the the signs that you aren't dealing with it and have got yeah. it um and the advice moving on so i'm just gonna let zoe sort of describe that how to address it how to know see the signs and realize that thank you emma you know i think this is the thing i think so many mental health issues are actually unresolved trauma. You know, I think trauma is really at the root and I don't think it's talked about enough. You know, we have this really great mental health awareness, which is, you know, compared to like 30 years ago is brilliant. But what we don't really have is trauma awareness. And um, so many mental health issues can be traced back to trauma. And so many people presenting at my clinic come in with, they're coming with a presenting issue, say a phobia, addiction, um, anxiety, depression, body dysmorphia, eating disorder, you know, it manifests in all, in all different ways. So really, if you've got any kind of stubborn issue um, that you can't consciously change, then it's usually at the heart of it, there has been you know, something or some things that have happened. Um, so the word trauma is misunderstood as well i think people think you know there's sort of it has to be big t trauma so you have to have gone through some kind of abuse in some way or severe emotional neglect but actually you know in a way just being here on planet earth we, we can all be traumatized um because none of us none of us were like fully met as, as children you know we've all had things happen to us um and we, we're all able to be traumatized and um one of the things i specialize in is um complex ptsd which is when someone's gone through an enormous amount of trauma we've obviously all heard about ptsd um you know we're all veterans and things like that so at any stage of our lives we can be traumatized and what trauma is really is something is, is a negative experience never to experience that impacts you and trauma tends to happen um quickly so it's always a shock to the system and it sort of happens in isolation i always say trauma happens swiftly and in isolation so we go through a shock of some kind and even though there might have been people around we felt very alone in that experience um so a lot of the work that I do is helping people recognise, and most people don't always recognise that they've gone through trauma. A lot of people say, I had no idea that that was actually registered as a trauma. So a lot of the work I do is helping people recognise that actually what's underneath what they're presenting with, which is, as I said, anxiety, depression, phobia, is often, often links back to something that happened um, a long, long time before. So... There's a really good saying, um, I say, use it all the time, it's Carl Jung, and he says, all neurosis has its reason in legitimate suffering. So it's like the thing that we're presenting with consciously, again, the eating disorder, the obsession, the terrible relationships, whatever the thing is that we keep doing or keep finding ourselves in or way of thinking or way of speaking to ourselves can often be sort of traced back to something that happened um, um, not so, it's not something that we're not aware of. It's just we're not aware that it didn't Im that it impacted us so deeply. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And the um and how can it sort of the, the manifest? Like what what signs? Because often you don't realise you're doing. You know what I mean? You're going after the same relationships, or even like the eating yeah. issues and stuff. Often it's very hard to pinpoint or to put it back to something you could because you're living in the moment aren't you you're kind yeah, of well this is the issue i have now so it's a now issue um yeah. and you don't yeah how do you sort of it, it's, look exactly to the yeah. well that's, yeah. that's what's always so interesting so there's we've got this sort of subconscious conscious split so it's exactly how you said it so we're living in the now we're living in the present and all we know is that um, we might have anxiety we might have this thing called repetition compulsion so we keep going out the same guy the same um, girl and we keep having these unhealthy relationships 
and we all, you know, we're, we're really struggling with our body image or um, if we're really struggling with anything, we keep doing a sort of compulsive behaviour or we're feeling continually unhappy in ourselves, which is presenting as anxiety and depression or low self-esteem. You know, it's basically about noticing what's going on for you. OK, so so how am I feeling in myself? Am I happy? Do, you know, are my relationships working out? Is this working out for me? Um, so any struggles that you have in the present, because it presents as a now problem, it presents as like a conscious issue. But every time I work with somebody, I was working with the subconscious, and it, it's always, it always goes back, nearly always goes back to that something that happened before. So something that happened a long time ago. Because the, the problem is the subconscious doesn't understand time. So we go through things when we're sort of five or 10 or 15 or 20, and consciously we just move on, you know, we just get on with it, we get on with life. But the subconscious is like a big storehouse, it just holds on to these things. And they're like kind of old wounds or grief or emotions that we haven't fully processed. And then it manifests consciously in the present as a struggle, something that we can't get over. So um, it can show up in so many ways. Um, there's a myriad of, of struggles and mental health issues that people present with. And so much of the time, it's because we haven't fully processed the event. It might be a heartbreak from 10 years ago. It might be something that we saw mum or dad go through when we were small. It might be not being fully met in childhood. So, you know, it's kind of vast and complex, as in you can always, uh, there's, there's so many ways it can it can manifest. But the most important thing is just to notice, really, okay, what am I still struggling with? What isn't going away on its own despite my best intentions? Because if you make a conscious effort to change something, if it's a conscious problem, it will change. You'll say, okay, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop going out with that kind of guy. Or I'm going to stop beating myself up about this. Or I'm going to stop yo-yo dieting or hating on myself, whatever that thing is. If it's a conscious problem, then you can stop doing that. But if the roots are deeper and there's stuff that you need to resolve, and it, you know, despite your best intentions, you keep going back to that behaviour, that way of thinking, or that struggle. Then it, I usually it means you need to look a bit deeper and understand what's driving that behaviour, or that thought pattern, or that way that you feel about yourself. Yeah, and just taking it to like you know what's been going on in the last year and a bit. I remember reading right at the beginning last yeah. year, March when the crazy started about PTSD, and it. I remember the the, the specific article I read was those with some parents especially mums with small children we're gonna the ptsd that would come out of their lockdown and then and what was happening with and i remember reading it going what and then thinking actually you don't and it, we've uh, you know we've got three under sixes and i've said you know me and my husband we kind of came out our summer we're like how do we do it how do we spend three months and doing full work with three hundred yeah. six? and we were like it's that survival mode isn't it and you don't realize yeah it's that how you know how it affects or you still don't realize because we're in it um, exactly. still in it. Just um, dealing with it you're getting on with it you're just dealing with life and we're all doing the best we can with the resources we have at the time aren't we you know and a lot of the time when something's different what's going on we just go into survival mode so you know we've got these kind of i always talk about this but we've got these sort of four we sort of we will we all have these four physiological defenses which are fight flight and then freeze and fawn so you know so something really difficult happens, you know, we deal with it with anxiety, I better get loads of things done, or we fight something that's difficult going on. If we have a big shock, we can drop into the freeze response, or we can go into that sort of fawn response, we feel really powerless. So we all have these kind of four physiological defences. And I think what, you know, and I've talked about this a lot, what sort of lockdown did was send was sort of shunt a lot of us into so those defences and then we kind of got stuck there. That's what people got stuck in anxiety. That's what people got stuck in raging. You know, that's what people got. Some people just kind of like went into depression and apathy and other people just went to a real feeling of powerlessness. And there's all, and there's behaviours so associated with all of those. So, you know, the anxiety can be constantly being on your phone, reading news. The fight response can be like constant arguing on social media. <laughs> you all know better that one. You and me, we don't know anything about yeah. that. <laughs> it's exactly. like my Twitter dumping ground. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Twitter rage. I must have the last word. Um, and a bit, so for some people, you know, you know, the, the lockdown experience, you know, they just didn't want to get out of bed. You know, duvet days became duvet weeks, you know, and um, they went into depression. Um, and for some people, they went into this real feeling of powerlessness. So we have these sort of four responses, these four inbuilt responses, and we need them. We needed them, we needed them from, 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 from day one. But the problem with um, 
uh, you know, obviously the lockdown experience is that a lot of us got stuck in those, but also when you've been traumatized or when you've gone through something really difficult, you can get stuck in those responses as well. Now, in the middle of all of the, the fight, flight, freeze and fall, there's a really lovely place called the window of tolerance. And that's when we feel good, we feel calm, we can sleep well, rest well, digest well, we can make good decisions, set good boundaries. And one of the um, most important pillars, I think, of mental health is just noticing, OK, which one of these responses have I gone into? Am I getting like the flight responses when you get super driven? So you're constantly working and constantly checking. You can get a bit OCD and, you know, um, you stop sleeping. Um, the fight response when you're constantly feeling angry, you might be kicking off at people. The freeze response is when you just got like no energy, you can't bother to do anything, you know, you just think I think is pointless. And then you've got this, you know, the fall response, which when you start to feel really powerless and you find it really difficult to set boundaries. So a really good little tool is just to notice which of these responses have I gone into. And from each of those responses you can because we don't want to get stuck in them because then that's when we start to get like really bad anxiety or really bad depression or you know it, it starts to really affect us physically and mentally. So the thing is to notice which of these am I in and then look at ways to bring you out. And of course, self-care is, you know, self-care has been talked about an enormous amount over the last year. I don't think we should have to self-care this much. I think it's ridiculous, you know, it's, you know, we should spend so much time self-caring. Um, but self-care is a really important pillar of mental health. So looking at, okay, am I getting a bit angry? Am I getting overly anxious? What's getting affected here? And working to get back into your window of tolerance, which is that place where you're kind of, you can feel a bit re more reasonable about things. You've got a bit more bandwidth, a bit more space. So you give yourself some time. And that's an important part of recovery as well. Yeah. And do you think the, um, with that, you know, saying all the four things, I think I every day is different to me. Yeah. <laughs> I like work oh, my yeah, way around all, all, all the, the four Fs. Years. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. But that's the it's being aware of it, isn't it? Um, yeah. Of what, what, which day it is. So stay away from people on the rage day. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. But do you think on, on that, it's because we're kind of still in it. Yeah. that you know what I mean we're still stuck and I have a friend of mine you know phone her about two months ago and said she's just knackered and exhausted and feels like she's been hit by a bus and she's going to have you know blood tests and I said we're stuck you're stuck in your front fight or flight you know yeah. and the adrenaline we're not meant to be in this state no. all, all the time we're meant to be in it when we see a lion that's about to charge across the savannah and eat exactly. us or take one of our cubs and it's that short spurt we're not yeah. meant to have been in it in this state for like 16 months <laughs> of it's just the thing. i mean the amount of adrenal fatigue is kind of yeah because you know our nervous systems are sort of fight rest recover not fight 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 and because of the amount of tech and because of, you know way there's you know you can choose to be plugged in all the time and there's constant news isn't there and we're constantly getting new information there's every day something new is happening at the moment around something else and something else and it can get super addictive so one of those things is kind of and it's always hard for everybody you know everybody is addicted to their phone as far as i can see yeah. but it's setting boundaries for yourself around that and saying you know i've just got to switch things off and i've it's, and you really need to find something else someone will let me know um so a, a really important part of recovery from this year from what's going on from childhood trauma from heartbreak from anything you know difficult in any adverse experience is giving yourself time space and you know really carving out time for rest because in the world that we live in now you know i said this before all of this lockdown stuff kicked off, kicked off we've never been subject to as much noise as we are now and literally the volume's gone right up hasn't it over the year so we have to actually just choose we have to say right well, i'm going to take this i'm going to carve this time out for myself to rest and recover because no one's going to give it to us no one's going to say oh, i think we should you know, go and take a break now or something like that unless things get really bad we have to sort of be selfish really and that's um and set that boundary for ourselves so what's your what's sort of your advice at the moment of like of living in the now where you know you can't switch it off um because it's still going on what's your sort of advice for just yeah Sort of doing that switching off for the day-to-day -day things are there any sort of tips and tricks that people can use to sort of yeah stave it all off and stay in the middle <laughs> yeah so i think you know go, going back to 
that that window of tolerance model notice which one you know bringing you can't really change anything unless you have awareness so noticing which of the responses that you might have gone into so if you've gone into flight mode then you know it's, again it's like come away from your phone calm down i always say when you're in that angry mode as well you know wait 24 hours before doing anything don't send an email from that place don't make a decision from that place and the same with flight mode as well when you're anxious we can our brains will tell us because we're hardwired like you talked to do something i need to act and actually I've got a really good saying, which is like, before you do something, just do nothing and just give yourself time to come back. Um, if you're in that freeze response, which is the depression, sort of apathy, what you need to do is just really nurture yourself and do sort of up, sort of up leveling activity. So maybe some gentle exercise, something like that. Connection with friends. Um, and if you're in the freeze response, which is that sort of powerless place, and every single one of us has gone into we, we switch between them all the time but every single one of us really with lockdown and everything else has gone into one of these and many of us have got stuck in these responses and they all require a lot of self-compassion a lot of self-love um and taking time for yourself and you know making sure that you do put the phone down and also the other thing as well is it's really important to be able to talk to someone so um, expression is the opposite of depression. It's the opposite of anxiety. People can get really ashamed when they feel like they do. And I think it's really vital that you're able to talk to somebody about how you're feeling. It might be a friend, it might be a partner, it might be a therapist, it might be online group, something like that. But you've got to be able to say, this is what I'm struggling with. Um, because, you know, it's impacted everybody, you know, just to, to, to some extent. Um, and we've got the usual self-care things, which is, um, you know, of getting out in nature, making sure you exercise, good nutrition. Because one of the things that happens when we don't feel good, we then start to treat ourselves. We can start to be treat ourselves a bit like crap, can't we? Because we don't feel good. It's easy to treat ourselves well when we feel well. I, I think I think it's much easier. Mm. But when we're not feeling good, is when we actually need it the most. But that's when we tend to like beat ourselves up. You know, drink too much wine, eat a load of crap, and just you know, just think, just throw everything out the window because we think we can't be bothered. But we need to sort of really nurture ourselves. So another one of the sort of main tools for recovery, I think, especially from trauma, and especially when you're in any, any of these kind of wired states, is kind of self-parenting. So you might not feel like you really like yourself, particularly in that moment when you're stressed out or you're angry, you've just had to go at somebody or, you know, you're just really anxious. <laughs> but what you need to do is just, um, you know, sort of, just sort of treat yourself in the way that you would... Um, a really you know, a really good friend you know how would I treat my friend right now that's just gone through something similar you know treating yourself with as much love as, as you would someone that you were really responsible for taking care of in a really good way self-parenting is, is such a it's not a particularly easy thing to do but if you keep practicing um, then it becomes a bit like a muscle like anything it's like if you work on your abs every day and um, it's it becomes something that you can sort of automatically do because our self-talk is really important. We've talked about this before, haven't we, in a previous um, session? Um, and noticing how you talk to yourself. Because, you know, our nervous system can't tell the difference between us criticising ourselves and someone else criticising us. You know, we have that same response. We, we go into anxiety. And whenever we feel judged, we get anxious or we get angry, which, again, sends us back into fight or fight. So it's about bringing yourself down, you know, like talking yourself down, making sure you get plenty of rest, um, putting the phone down, realising you don't have to respond for everybody all the time, that you're allowed time off, setting healthy boundaries for yourself um, and practising talking to yourself in a good way and getting the support if you need to. If it's, you know, some of these things we can do ourselves and sometimes we need support. I always say support's the answer to everything. So... Yeah. Uh, there's some of the top things I think that cool. and um someone someone just mentioned it and I was gonna um say anyway that um as women we're bad at it as women we you know that whole I love saying just be selfish you know yeah. that and then and it's it doesn't come naturally you know what I mean it's sort of the guilt right. then and someone's asked asked that question about how do you stop feeling guilty about looking after yourself because it's there but my yeah. thing is I have these little people as you know in my head and one of them is guilt and I'll just say no sit down and have a drink you know so if it gets a bit gobby I'll sit yeah it's the thing you have I have the little conversations in my head on those yeah. ones yeah it's, it's right you do yeah you definitely because the thing is we're not just one person there's like there's a whole there's a whole city in there isn't there really you know there's different parts of us um I always say with guilt you know and get because 
you know, listen, I was all brought up. So I was trained to be a brilliant people pleaser. I've had to really work on that myself. So it's kind of, you know, when you say no, you say yes to yourself. Because if we say yes when we mean no, we get resentful of ourselves. We get resentful to the other person. Um, but, you know, a lot of time I work with clients and say, you've got to start saying no and you've got to start setting boundaries. And they'll say, I do, but I feel really guilty about it. And I say, you just have to tolerate the feeling of guilt. You just have to tolerate it you know for a bit until it stops feeling because it's like anything you keep practicing it um and we can feel guilty not being able to help everybody but we're not here to serve everyone you know we can't pour from an empty cup and it's after a while you know setting good about having good boundaries for yourself and having good boundaries other people you can say it really lovingly say no i just can't do that i don't have the bandwidth for that at the moment you don't have to you know in ask about it you know you can just set a healthy boundary around these things after a while, you know, you start to set, when you first start setting boundaries, it can feel really painful. Like I say to my clients, set boundaries and they come back and like, everybody hates it. And I said, well, they will because they're used to you doing everything for them. Um, and I say, you've got to allow yourself a bit of that kickback. And when we first start setting boundaries, we're not used to it. All sorts of feelings can come up, guilt, shame, or then we can just set a boundary and do that classic thing of just taking it back off. Oh, actually, no, I will help you after all, even though we're exhausted. So I think it's about allowing yourself to feel uncomfortable. Okay, I feel really guilty about setting that boundary or, you know, this, it's brought up this feeling that I, sh I shouldn't have done that. Allowing yourself to be with that, keeping that boundary anyway. And then if you keep doing it after a while, it becomes an unapologetic boundary. By mm. that point, you don't have to be rude, but you're just saying, no, I can't do that. I honestly don't have time for that. And also, another thing I think is helpful with boundaries is to think is to turn it the other way around. So, if a friend's asking to do something and you don't have the time or the energy to do it, think about if you'd ask them and they'd said no, you'd probably be fine with it. So, it's we can take all this responsibility and kind of weight of burdens on upon ourselves. And actually, people don't always expect it anyway. So. Yeah. I think, I think you have to have to tolerate guilt, first of all, when you're setting boundaries. I think as women, we're trained to be guilty and we're trained to be uselessly nice at times as well, aren't we? And we're also trained to be people pleasers. Yeah, and I, exactly. I have too much on learning around that stuff. I would, you know, I would twist myself into a people pleasing pretzel just to make sure they, <laughs> they weren't really pleased, they were pleased temporarily. And I was exhausted and resentful. So, you know, I had to unlearn that one. I spent quite a bit of time doing it and be patient with yourself about it as well because. You know, when we've been conditioned and conditioned and conditioned, then it takes a while um, uh, to to start to feel really anchored in your own system to be able to say no healthily. And if you have gone through trauma or you've got in a family where um, perhaps it wasn't okay to say no, or you didn't see your mum say no, then, you know, that's something that you need to take time to unlearn. Yeah, and with guilt, I, I you know, I, I would say I feel guilty all day, every day. It's there. When, yeah, you're when you're juggling stuff you bit yeah. it's there i don't fight it and i'd go yeah. well but i'm not doing anything wrong and i need this for me and it will make me a happier person so everyone else is happier so it's just sort of having it there and actually that just sort of you, it just sort of gets put not pushed down but it's just aware of it. it's like fear you know what i mean you can't if you yeah. try and fight fear if you try and fight guilt you're just fighting and you're yeah. trying to blocking it whereas if you go they're there like i said they're little people in my head having cups of tea with each other and <laughs> if one gets a bit gobby then i'll just you know talk to it tell it to sit the fuck down <laughs> and then while i yeah. do but knowing yeah. that you're not doing anything wrong yeah. so the same with self-care it's like the nicola who's asked the question is you're going to feel guilty and you're never going to not feel guilty it's being able mm. to override that feeling and have words with it and go but i'm not doing anything wrong and i need this i want this so shut up and sit down guilt <laughs> i'm gonna yeah, get on with yeah, it yeah exactly <laughs> this is the thing it's allowing our feelings to be there that fighting them because whatever we resist persists so you know i often work with clients like i want you to get rid of my anxiety so we're not going to get rid of anything you know we're going to let it be there because we, we try and fight it if we say to ourselves oh i must sleep we're not going to worry i mustn't feel anxious we will you know <laughs> i mustn't feel guilty but then i mustn't drink that wine i do yeah and then we will <laughs> go into resistance about so it's like it's allowing it to be there so okay i feel guilty about the fact i'm taking some time for myself but that's okay I, it can be there just sitting on my shoulder but i'm just going to do the thing anyway um because otherwise it just becomes a real stopper and we'll, we'll end up burning ourselves out but yeah there's a lot to i really agree with you. there's a lot to be said for just letting feelings be there and you know i say to people all the time you know it's okay to be anxious it's okay to be scared and do things anyway you know it's um courage isn't like an absence of fear that's that's being brain dead isn't it courage is like you know feeling the fear and doing it anyway and self-care is sometimes feeling guilty and doing it anyway 
Yeah, so, and it's very—it was like jealousy, isn't it? When people are like, you shouldn't, you know, actually, no, it's natural for everyone to feel jealous or resentful yeah. of something. And again, it's that of being aware of the feelings, living with them, and knowing why they're there, and not beating yeah. someone up who's doing nothing because you're being insecure and feeling jealous. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, so. exactly. We all get jealous, you know, we're, and allowing ourselves to be human. I think one of the most unhelpful things we can ever do is say to ourselves, I shouldn't be feeling like this. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like shooting all over yourself. Now, I should be feeling better. I should be happier. I should be pleased for them. Well, maybe you're not, you know. It's just allowing yourself to feel how you feel um, is really important because otherwise you're just cutting great big parts of yourself off and then, like, you know, they just come back stronger, don't they? They just bite you on the bum later on. Yeah, you know, they come back with full force. Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of a lot of recovery from anything, a lot of being with yourself, and that's very window of tolerance as well, which is accepting yourself, allowing the feelings to be there, and realizing that you know it's just like when we get we all get triggered, right? So we get triggered things. We'll get anxious. We'll get angry. We'll kick off. You know, things will happen. We might go into a super freeze mode. We might go into sort of feeling really frozen and really shocked. And again, with triggers, which is a, a large part of healing from trauma. Is allowing yourself to ride those triggers out. Now that can be really, you know, you know, I, I work with a lot of CPTSD clients, and it's it's really really painful for them to to work through triggers um, and sit the triggers because what we can tend to do is think, oh, this feeling is so awful, I need to do something about it, I need to get rid of it. But actually, the key to healing is. Um, it's not really that our, our wounds go away or that our triggers go away. It's just that we become much better at being able to bear pain. Do you see what I mean? So we become bigger and stronger. And then when we don't put ourselves under pressure to not have that feeling, um, then we're not scared of it anymore. And then when we're not scared of having a certain feeling like anxiety or guilt, then they don't tend to come back with such um, violence, I suppose. Cool. Well, do you know what? That's a great ending <laughs> to this chat so as a snippet quick snippet we could talk for hours on these things yeah, and zoe yeah. feel free to sort of stalk her on all her social media yeah, um account she loves that yeah. um, if you want if you want more info um but yeah thank you what would be give one tip for like people today to deal with to, and to deal with the crazy okay so here's something i really i think doing i think you know all day every day we're all doing so much we're dealing with so much noise and white static and demands and everything else you know one of my favorite things is sitting down and having a just having a cup of tea with your feelings and going right okay then sit down have a cup of tea how am I feeling and allowing yourself to feel however you do and accepting that and even if it's just five minutes that you're carving out for yourself at the beginning of the day you can build up to it and sit there for 10 minutes or an hour however long but sitting having a cup of tea with your feelings allowing yourself to feel however you are and then getting on with your day just giving yourself that bit of time perfect what do you know anyone watching go and have a cup of tea cup feelings. of tea with your with your feelings um yeah. cool well i will see you later zoe for uh, actually lovely. a real, a real life me. glass of wine so I'll yes exactly glass of wine with our feelings <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> and rage cool. i'll see you later thanks bye, bye.